diabetes mellitus is actually a syndrome so it's not a single disease it's a, it's a group of disorders abnormal glucose metabolism is in the center of the universe but you have many other things around it you have metabolic disorders affecting protein metabolism lipid metabolism and so on there is chronic hyperglycemia which means there is elevated blood glucose levels this is how clinically we diagnose diabetes okay but there is much more going inside a person's body affecting lipid metabolism protein metabolism and so on diabetes indicates an increased urine output mellitus is latin for honey so there is copious amounts of urine which is also sweet there are three main types of diabetes type 1 is absolute insulin deficiency type 2 is insulin resistance with an insulin secretory deficit there's a third type which is called gestational diabetes which develops in pregnant women remember pancreas and it's two different components embedded together so you have exocrine pancreas which is this part you have cells that produce enzymes and bicarbonate which is then secreted via the duct into the duodenum that is exocrine part right and then in between you have these isles of langerhans which has cells that produce hormones which are directly secreted into the blood vessels okay so if you look at pancreas the exocrine pancreas is uh, the acnr cells and ductal cells producing enzymes and solutes mainly bicarbonate the endocrine pancreas is isles of langerhans that produces hormones insulin and glucagon so this shows you the homeostatic role of insulin and glucagon so once you have a nice meal which i hope you had this morning yeah blood glucose levels will go up right this will then this hyperglycemia will stimulate the beta cells in the isles of langerhans in pancreas okay also when the food is in gut it releases incretins which also go and stimulate the beta cells in isles of langerhans this will these cells the beta cells will release insulin okay what insulin will do it will cause the glucose to enter into all cells in the body notably liver liver will store the glucose as glu as glycogen okay which can be used later so it will store glucose as glycogen blood glucose levels will begin to drop yeah this is what normally happens glucose goes up in the blood insulin is released and blood glucose levels begin to drop right now when you haven't eaten for a few hours blood glucose levels keep going down now glucagon will be released which will then try to bring the glucose levels up to maintain a minimum level of glucose in the blood okay so when glucose levels decrease this is called hypoglycemia there are many things that will happen when there is hypoglycemia so first thing is this one the pancreatic ile cells this time alpha cells they will release glucagon okay sympathetic nervous system will be activated to adrenal medulla will release adrenaline plus anterior pituitary gland will be stimulated it will uh, produce acth which will stimulate adrenal cortex to make cortisol okay plus pituitary gland will also release growth hormone now glucagon and adrenaline they will act on liver to break down glycogen when glycogen breaks down glucose will be released into the blood stream to maintain blood glucose levels uh cortisol and growth cortisol has effect on the liver plus it reduces glucose utilization by peripheral cells okay growth hormone also reduces glucose utilization by peripheral cells <clears throat> all these effects will lead to increased blood glucose levels so this is overall glucose homeostasis this is a typical insulin receptor which is present 
on virtually all cells in the body. So this is cell membrane. This is the insulin receptor. Okay, it is a tyrosine kinase receptor. When insulin binds to this receptor, okay, there is uh, a change in the receptor. It uh, catalyzes a lot of reactions inside the cell. Okay, now out of those reactions, the one which causes the cells to take up glucose is that glucose transporter, which is in the cytoplasm, it is inserted in the cell membrane. So now you have a doorway from where glucose can enter the cells. Okay, so when insulin binds to cells, it causes the glucose transporter to be inserted in cell membrane, allowing a pathway for the glucose to enter the cells. And glucose enters by facilitated transport. If it is higher outside, it will enter the cells. Okay. In addition to this, now this is the immediate effect of insulin, glucose moving into the cells. Plus, it has many other effects in the cells. Okay, so it transcribes many genes, it causes protein synthesis, causes fat synthesis, also causes glucose synthesis in the cells. Okay, so it has a lot of effects in the cells. So what is diabetes mellitus? We will look at type 1 first. 10% of all diabetic patients in Australia are type 1. Uh, and this is among the top 10 globally for type 1 diabetes diagnosis. So Australia is actually ranking quite higher in the terms of diabetes, okay? especially type 1. Now, this type 1 diabetes results from destruction of beta cells, which is in most cases autoimmune. The exact mechanism is still not known. There are different theories. The most commonly accepted theory is that there is an interaction between the gene and the environment. Okay? So people who are genetically susceptible, and when, if there is an environmental insult on top of it, the autoimmune reaction will lead to destruction of beta cells. Okay? So most commonly, the gene that is involved is the HLA region, chromosome 6. The environmental factor could be a viral infection that triggers autoimmune reaction against the beta cells, and beta cells are destroyed. There is 50% concordance rates in twins, so 50% chance of having type 1 diabetes if the twin has it, and between 10 to 13% of individuals with newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes have a first degree relative with type 1 diabetes. So it kind of runs in families. Okay, there is genetic predisposition. Now, before diabetes becomes manifest, which means hyperglycemia develops, 80 to 90% of beta cells must be destroyed. So, which means when the patient presents clinically, most of islet cells, the beta cells, have already been destroyed. With this lack of insulin, there is a relative excess of glucagon. Glucagon is acting opposite to insulin, right? Alpha cells are spared. So there is some sec glucagon secretion is always there. So you have a, a, a misbalance now. Insulin has gone down and glucagon is secreted more than normal. So hyperglycemia and ketonemia. Now ketonemia is when glucose is not available for the cells. Now these people who have diabetes, they have a lot of glucose in their blood right? They have hyperglycemia. But this glucose is not entering the cells. So cells are living in a glucose deficient environment. Although there's, there's a lot of glucose outside, but they can't use it. So the metabolism shifts to lipids, fatty acids. And that leads to production of ketone bodies or keto acids. So this is called ketonemia. Okay. And we'll discuss this later in detail. So these two uh, can result from insulin deficiency alone, but when you have relative excess of glucagon, the situation becomes even worse. Okay. How do patients present? Now, well, this is the classic triad of uh, diabetes polyphagia, polydipsia, polyuria. So these people are always thirsty, always hungry, and they are going to the loo all the time. Okay. But this is classic. 
not every patient will present like this. Okay? They may be present, may not be present. Now, the diagnosis of diabetes is not difficult when these symptoms are present. Um, in addition to these three symptoms, there is also weight loss and, of course, hyperglycemia. Now, weight loss is found in type 1 diabetes. In type 2, it's actually weight gain. Now, this hyperglycemia can be determined using a simple glucometer. And nowadays, these are available. People can test uh, the glucose levels at home, right? Very easy to do. But there are two uh, types of blood samples that are used to measure blood glucose, fasting and postprandial. Okay, fasting is when you haven't eaten anything for at least 10 to 12 hours. So you have your dinner, then you sleep. Early morning, you take a blood sample. That reading of glucose is called fasting blood glucose. If you had a meal and you take sample, say about two or two and a half hours after the meal, this is called postprandial uh, sample. But sometimes um, the postprandial sample is taken at any time. So it is sometimes called random blood glucose. Management of diabetes requires individual planning according to type of disease, age, activity level. Um, but all individuals require some combination of insulin because the main problem in type 1 diabetes is lack of insulin. Beta cells are not producing enough insulin. So you have to provide them insulin. And of course, meal planning. Now, insulin is not coming from the pancreas, right? So you have to, when you prescribe insulin to these patients, they have to take meal and insulin in a, in a scheduled pattern. And of course, exercise, all right? Uh, so in order to maintain a healthy lifestyle, okay? Uh, how do you evaluate? So one thing I told you earlier, you can measure blood glucose levels. You can also measure hemoglobin. Okay, this is glycated or glycosylated hemoglobin A1C. So hemoglobin, uh, the globin chain gets glycosylated. So glucose can attach to it and can remain attached to it. And do you remember how long is the, what is the lifespan of red blood cells? 120 days. So once hemoglobin gets glycosylated, it remains glycosylated. So if one, if molecule of hemoglobin gets glycosylated, it will be circulating in the blood for 120 days by the time the red blood cell is destroyed. So measuring HbA1c can actually help you look back in time. So looking at how much hemoglobin is glycosylated, you can have an idea how was the glycemic control in this patient for the last three to four months. Now, the acute and chronic complications, evaluation and treatment of type 1 diabetes are similar to those seen in type 2. So we will look at some common features of type 1 and type 2. Okay, we'll discuss them together. All right, this is a table that captures some differences between type 1 and type 2. Type 1 diabetes is insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, also called IDDM or type 1. Also called juvenile diabetes, juvenile onset. Because of genetic predisposition, it usually starts early in life. So type one will start early in life in young children. Type two is non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, N-I-D-D-M. And this is maturity onset, usually begins by the age of late 30s or 40s. So age of onset for type one is less than 20 years, for type 2 is usually more than 35 years. Onset of symptoms, type 1 is usually sudden, but type 2 is very, very gradual. It takes longer time to present clinically. Body weight, type 1 people are usually non-obese. Type 2, 80% of them are usually obese. Etiology, now in type 1, as we discussed, it is predisposition is inherited, so there is genetic susceptibility, plus there is probably a viral infection that causes an autoimmune reaction and destruction of uh, beta cells. Uh, in case of type two, there is also family history, 
there are risk factors advancing age obesity uh, cardiovascular disease metabolic syndrome tobacco use so all these are implicated in type 2 diabetes okay there is family history there is no specific genetic susceptibility although so maybe the risk factors which are for type 2 diabetes are uh, running in the family so it could be dyslipidemias obesity and so on so type 2 is about 85 percent so most patients of diabetes are type 2 15 percent are type 1 insulin levels now in case of type 1 insulin levels are low or even completely absent because beta cells are not producing insulin in case of type 2 the insulin levels may be low could be normal could be even higher than normal the reason for that is the main pathology in type 2 is not destruction of beta cells beta cells are there they are producing insulin the problem is insulin is unable to act on target cells which is called insulin resistance okay insulin resistance so in type 1 there is no insulin resistance in type 2 there is insulin resistance insulin receptors are normal in type 2 insulin receptors are defective this is what causes insulin resistance all right uh, complications are frequent in both diabetes ketoacidosis are very common uh, is very common in type 1 it is rare in type 2 dietary modifications are mandatory in both and treatment for type 1 insulin is a must you have to replace insulin in type 2 there are multiple approaches you have to use dietary control exercise oral hypoglycemic agents the oral drugs that bring down the blood glucose levels in some cases in type 2 diabetes you have to use insulin as well because after a while the beta cells burn out and insulin levels begin to drop then you have to supplement insulin in type 2 diabetes as well so usually people with type 2 diabetes 10 to 20 years in the disease they might require insulin as well okay